My name is Pamela Goka, and I will be demonstrating the basic examination of the musculoskeletal system in children. This is different from the neurological examination, even though there is some overlap. And the neurological examination will be dealt with in a different session. All clinical examination should be preceded by taking a relevant history. Some of the things you would want to note with respect to the musculoskeletal system is the presence of pain, swelling, deformity, limitation of movement. You would also be interested in things like antecedent trauma, associated fever, and family history, depending on the case. In children, a lot of the examination is achieved just by observing the child in spontaneous activity rather than giving formal instructions. And this is even more pertinent the younger the child. There are key things that we would pay attention to in the examination, just as in the examination of other parts of the body. So, first of all, you need to inspect or observe the patient. Then, you need to feel or palpate the relevant part. And with respect to the musculoskeletal system, you would want to expose both limbs so that you can compare one to the other. Thirdly, we would then examine for movement across joints and at the same time assess for the function of the particular limb. In examining for movement across the joints, we can examine for active or passive movements. With the upper limbs, we would usually ask the patient to do the movements actively. But where he is unable to do so, then we will do the movements passively for him. And this helps us to assess the range of movement. We will start with the examination of the upper limbs. And first of all, we will inspect to take note of any swelling, malalignment that may be present right from the shoulder all the way to the hands. Right from the shoulder all the way to the hands. Next, we'll have paid for areas of tenderness. But first of all, you have to find out from the patient if he has pain anywhere. If he does, then you palpate that area last, making sure that you do it gently so that you do not cause extra pain to the patient. So, Emmanuel, do you have pain anywhere? No. So, we palpate. And we look at the patient's face so that you can tell whether there is any pain. If there is any pain, you grade it by making note whether the patient just winces or the patient winces and withdraws from the pain or the patient does not even allow you to touch at all which would indicate that there is severe tenderness. So we will examine the movements across the various joints and these movements have implication for functional abilities of the patient. So first of all, starting from the shoulder joint, we will demonstrate abduction, adduction, flexion, internal rotation, and external rotation. We are demonstrating abduction, adduction, flexion at the shoulder, internal rotation as he puts his hand behind his back, 
and then external rotation as he puts his hand behind his head. And in the younger child, to engage them, you can pretend that they are combing their head, for example, and that makes it more fun for them. Next, we will examine movements at the elbow joint. So the main movements are flexion and extension, as well as pronation and supination. Pronation and supination. You will do that on both sides. We will then also examine for movements at the wrist joint for flexion and extension and also the small joints in the hand flexion and extension Ex extension flexion for the examination of the lower limbs we want the patient to stand and then you observe the posture of his legs as he's standing. Some children may have bowing of the legs, others may have knock knees, and you take note of this or any other form of deformity that you may note, swelling. Then you ask the patient to walk so that you can observe his gait. Whilst the patient is walking, you focus on his gait. With the musculoskeletal system, the patient may have pain and therefore spend more time on the good limb as opposed to the painful one. And this is called an antalgic gait. On the other hand, the patient may also have some muscle weakness and therefore you find that gives an abnormal gait and we take note of all these. With the patient on the couch, you then do further inspection of the limbs, again looking for areas of swelling or deformity, areas of inflammation in terms of redness, which may be present. We again, like we did in the upper limbs, palpate for areas of tenderness after asking the patient whether he has pain in any particular part. So you start your palpation very gently, so observing the patient's face. You do it on both sides. We will then proceed with examination of movements across the various joints. So we will start with the hip joint. We first test for flexion at the hip joint. So observing if the patient has any tenderness. Then we examine for internal rotation with a tie at 90 degrees. You internally rotate, see how far you can go, see whether the patient is in pain. You also externally rotate. And then to check for extension at the hip joint, you let the patient lie on his side. And then you extend, stabilize him with one hand and extend. We then proceed to examine the knee joint. We check for flexion and extension. And you note in patients who have hypermobile joints, you find that you'll be able to extend beyond the 180 degrees. With respect to the knee joint, if it is swollen, you want to determine if there is any fluid 
in the joint. So you apply pressure from on the thigh from above the knee, trying to push whatever fluid may be present down, and then you balot the patella with your finger. If there is fluid in the joint, you will find that the patella, which has been raised from the tibial surface, will now hit the tibial surface as you depress and you feel a knocking feel and this is called the patella tap sign. This, the absence of this does not necessarily mean that there is no fluid in the joint because you need to have a certain amount of fluid present to be able to elicit the sign. Another thing you can do to determine whether there is fluid in the joint, in the knee joint, is to massage the medial aspect of the knee joint. Any fluid there will be pushed back into the joint cavity and then you tap the lateral aspect and you find the fluid filling back into the hollow that was created. So those are two ways to examine for fluid in the knee joint. It is also important to check for movement at the ankle joint. So we check for dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, making sure that the there is no tightening of the tendons around the ankle joint. If you are unable to fully dorsiflex, it implies that there is shortening in the Achilles tendon. In patients with suspected muscular dystrophy, we ask them to sit on the floor and get up from that position into a standing position. This child did it normally, but in a child with muscular dystrophy, he would support himself by holding the thighs with the hand. And that is what is referred to as the Gower's sign. We will now proceed to examine the spine. The patient should be examined from the lateral aspect as well as from posteriorly. Now, looking at him from the lateral aspect, you want to take note of the natural curves of the spine. The cervical and the lumbar spine naturally curve anteriorly slightly, and the thoracic spine naturally curves posteriorly slightly. And you want to take note whether there is an exaggeration of any of these curvatures or loss of any of these curvatures, both of which will be abnormal. A pronounced posterior curvature is referred to as a kyphosis, and a pronounced anterior curvature is referred to as lordosis. In some cases, there's a pronounced angulation at a particular part of the spine due to collapse of one or a few adjacent vertebral bodies, and that is referred to as a gibbous. When you examine the patient from the back, you want to take note of whether there is any curvature of the spine to the right or the left. The normal spine should be straight down without any lateral curvatures. Where there is any curvature to the left or to the right, this is referred to as a scoliosis. And we usually say that the scoliosis is towards the right where the convexity is towards the right. After examining for the presence of kyphosis or scoliosis, we also want to take note of any 
abnormal swellings along the spine. We then proceed to palpate for areas of tenderness. So, take note of the patient's reaction. We then proceed to examine for movements across the spine. So first of all, we ask the patient to bend forwards, making an attempt to touch his toes without bending his knees. I think it will be best on the side. So, remember. You also I then examine for extension. After this, we examine for lateral flexion. And finally, you examine for rotation. Thank you.